What's up? Good, good evening. I almost said good morning. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are 701. That's not the worst thing in the world. Um, we're going to be in Psalm 32 tonight. Uh, so if you do have Bibles, you can kind of find your way to Psalm 32. But I will open us uh, in a prayer, doxology. Then Lisa's going to lead us in some worship, um, and we'll get we'll get rolling. And hopefully, the kids will will be pretty good. Uh, you may hear them. You probably will hear them. Um, good to see you, Lydia. Good to see the Lahats, the Leech. We're good to see uh, the normal crew in this place. Um, we miss you guys as always. Uh, it was uh, uh, good to be able to connect with people. Um, the few times that I've been on Tuesdays, it's been really nice to be able to see the guys who were there on Tuesdays. This last Tuesday was not was not in the cards for me, but I'm I, I know that Jake was able to be there and some of the other guys and stuff that haven't always been able to, and so that was cool. And I know that he was blessed being there. I was just talking to Jake on the phone a few minutes ago, and he was praying praying for us for the service for the word and so it's like old times it was really cool um so let me say a prayer and i'll open the service and then uh, we'll sing the docs together okay um dear jesus we thank you so much for the service we thank you so much for the opportunity to meet in spirit and in truth to be able to connect with you um, to be able to look into your word together to be able to find life and hope and lord to be able to worship you to be able to continue to give you praise continue to acknowledge who you are, your goodness, your glory, your mercy on us, Lord. Uh, even now, Lord, we pray for anyone who's sick, anyone who's afraid of being sick, anyone who's been struggling or going through things alone, having difficulty, Lord, during this time. We just pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would free that person to know that they are loved, to know that your presence is with them, to know that you can preserve them through any storm. That they would find a good word tonight, uh, a word that would be able to direct their hearts and lift their spirits, uh, and a word to worship you with, something that they can hold on to, that they can praise you from that place. So I lift up anybody who is, who is struggling or who is worried right now um, about the times in which we live or about some special circumstance in their life. I just pray, Lord, that you would free us of the burdens we are not meant to carry, that you would show us a way to live that is full, full of life, full of hope, full of joy. And we give you this service, and we ask your blessing on all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. What's up, Nicole? What's up, Bishop? What's up, Katie? All right, I'm going to get distracted if I just look at the roll hi, call. Everyone. Elisa says hi, everyone. Uh, let's sing the doxology together. If you are there, uh, please sing the doxology with us. And the doxology, of course, goes... God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Three songs. What? Say hi. Hi, say hi. Sorry, awkward. I am awkward. Okay, we're gonna sing three songs. Um, nothing to fear. You are my hiding place, and great is your faithfulness.
and God bless you guys. Love you guys. Um, let's pray one more time. Thank you, Lord, for opening up a place of worship for us tonight. Thank you for helping us to be your church, no matter what. And for not needing things we don't need, but for being able to be patient and resilient, to wait on you, to seek you. And I thank you that we're able to seek you where we are, and we're able to be connected by your grace where we are. I pray, Lord, that as we turn to your scripture, you would open the word in a way that gives us access to your heart, that gives us access to our own hearts, Lord, uh, to know ourselves and to know you. Those things should be happening at one and the same moment. And so I pray that you would open up something uh, that we need to see tonight, open up a place where we can hear a word from you and hold on to it. Um, marinate on it, reflect on it, uh, and be able to bear fruit in this, in this season. Um, this is a season of harvest in so many ways, but it could also be a season of gathering. You may be gathering new Christians even now um, who are interested in you, who are seeking you, who want to know more about you, who want to follow you, who want to take you more seriously. And so I pray that this would, would be an evening of, of gathering gathering your people together and of gathering more people to your family. And we lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Psalm 32 is where we are at tonight. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 32, Psalm of David. Let's see. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that, there may not, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. My friends, this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, during this time, I've been trying to be more uh, reflective. And one of the ways I've been trying to be more reflective is by not allowing my heart to get caught up in the immediate news cycle the way it's tempted to get caught up. In the immediate news cycle um, and so one of the things I had been doing is I've been going back to some old books uh, things I studied uh, during my doctorate degree at UCI that I at first things that I had to study and then things that I had fallen in love with and, and had sort of enjoyed studying things I might have written on or, or had planned to write things on um, maybe I did maybe I didn't but one of those texts that came up years ago that I found to be just incredibly rich um, was a text by John Donne, uh, the English poet from the 17th century, who I've talked about before. Um, he was a he was a love poet who became an Anglican priest and ended up writing some of the 
for me, some of the best sermons in the English language and, and some of the deepest reflections on life and spirituality that, um, that I've come across. And yeah, he's not really well known. Well, he's not really well known in general uh, today, but he's not really well known for, for any of his spiritual writing. Um, if you do study him or if you ever do come across him, you usually read his poetry. Uh, and it's usually a secular poetry, actually. Um, but there's this book um, I have right here. Look at that guy. Come on. Take it easy, ladies. Uh, this is John Dunn. This is Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Um, and yeah, he's got a nice rouge. Uh, but yeah, look at those lips. Um, but anyway, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. This is an incredible text. And it's this text that when he, when he became incredibly ill in 1623, he was, uh, he was like on his deathbed. And he had become a priest seven or eight years before, and he was really well known. He was the, the basically the, the, the priest of St. Paul's Cathedral. I don't know if you've ever been to London, but it's, it's the cathedral. It's incredible. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Uh, and so he was well known. He was well known even by the king himself, King James. And, and yet when he got sick all of a sudden um, and stayed sick for a long, long time, he began to write uh, on his sickbed these reflections. I think this is a really important time for us to be more con contemplative than we may have been in our older lives, in, 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 the, in the old world, as it were. I know everybody's excited and rushing to try to go back, although California had a little spike yesterday and today. So, you know, slow down, uh, mask up, uh, don't be foolish. But but there is something in trying to go back to normal where the contemplative life and a life that's deeply reflective can get lost if you're not careful. And so I found myself, I mean, I found myself going to the 17th century of all places, but it's because there's some of the most contemplative spiritual writing and reflection that I at least have come across, certainly in English. I will just say that, certainly in English, the English language. Um, the first meditation that John Donne uh, gives here, when he first gets sick, I'm going to read just some sections of it. Basically, he, he gets sick, he gets what we believe is sort of typhus, um, which, was, which was pretty much deadly at the time. I mean, any kind of fever, but especially typhus, would have been um, a pretty good chance that you weren't going to make it. Um, and when he, when he writes his very first meditation, there's a series of meditations he writes during his sickness, um, and eventually he does recover. Uh, and his meditations are on the human condition, his meditations are on the frailty of, of the body. You know, he had really, really incredible reflections about the human body, about our physicality, about our health, about, about you know, what we would call sort of wellness, you know, just sort of like what we are as a physical being. Incredibly deep meditations. But the first one, when he first gets sick, it opens with variable and therefore miserable condition of man. This minute I was well, and am ill this minute. I'm surprised with a sudden change and alteration to the worse, and I can impute no cause, nor call it any name. We study health. We deliberate upon our food, our drink, our air, our exercise. We hew and we polish every stone that goes into that building, and so our health is a long and regular work, but in a minute, a cannon batters everything overthrows everything, demolishes everything. A sickness unprevented for all our diligence, unsuspected for all our curiosity, nay undeserved, suddenly seizes us, possesses us, destroys us in an instant. He talks about how we're so sort of like thoughtful and careful, this is the 17th century, about our health and our physical well-being. He says that we, you know, we, we hew it, we polish it like a stone. It, it demands so much of our intention. We're always thinking about how to stay healthy, how to stay fit, how to stay well, how to guard against illness, all these kinds of things. John and I have been throwing our voice to try to get people to take their health seriously, to take what's going on seriously, especially to take the health of their neighbor and particularly vulnerable people more seriously. So. We've been trying to raise our voice to, to take things seriously when it comes to uh, the frailty of the, of the human frame and all these kinds of things. But Dunn just acknowledged, man, we, we really have, you know, have always been, you know, sort of in our own cultures, sort of uh, really focused on the body, really focused on how to be well and really 
focus on trying to avoid sickness. And he said, yeah, he says, and yet in a moment, you can go from yesterday you felt fine, and today suddenly everything changes. And so even despite our best sort of efforts and our attentions and our work and our, you know, reading and our researching and our whole, you know, everything and our, and our whole foods and our, you know, whatever quinoa diet, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, he's like, it just, in a moment, you can just have it all go away. And it can seem so unfair because we're so frail. And then he says this in his second part of his reflection, he says, that our bodies are like dust and ashes. They're so frail, they're so weak. Made from the dust to dust you shall return, right? As the scripture says. And he says, you know, the Lord has sort of gathered these ashes. He's preserved these ashes. But he says, but I am the dust and the ashes of the temple of the Holy Ghost. And what marble is so precious? So even though I'm so frail, so weak, dust and ashes, because I am the dust and ashes temple of the Holy Ghost, what marble is more valuable than a human being, right? What, what stuff is more valuable in the world than, than God's imprint on a human being? And he says, because I am more than dust and ashes. I am my best part. I am my soul. And being so, the breath of God, I may breathe back these pious expostulations to my God. My God, my God, why is not my soul as sensible as my body. Why hath not my soul the same apprehensions and presages and changes and antidotes or premonitions, jealousies, suspicions of sin that my body does of sickness? And so all of a sudden there's this turn here and he is physically wiped out on his sick bed, which may be his deathbed, just thinking about, just deeply thinking about the weakness of his body. And then he has this thought, he says, but I'm not just a body. I am a soul, a soul given by God. And then he starts to think, why are we so good at worrying about and trying to guard against the, the physical sickness or the, or the weaknesses or the health of our physical bodies, but we're not that good at protecting the health of our souls. We're not as interested. You don't, you're not gonna get nearly as many books on the health of the soul as you are in our culture on the health of the body, right? You're not gonna get nearly as much attention on the development of your soul and uh, ways of making sure that you're getting sort of good, the good gut bacteria for your soul as you are going to get all of these things about how you should live and what you should eat that we're obsessed with when it comes to our physical well-being or let's just be honest, our physical appearance. And so he says, man, the body is something we're really good at worrying about, obsessing about, thinking about, but the soul is something that we're not very good at worrying about, thinking about, planning for. He says, why is there not always a pulse in my soul to beat at the approach of a temptation to sin? Why are there not always waters in my eyes to testify to my spiritual sickness? I stand in the way of temptations naturally, necessarily. All men do, for there is a snake in every path, temptations in every vocation. But I go, I run, I fly into the ways of temptations, which I might shun. Nay, I break into the houses where the plague is. And he's talking about sin. He's like, I'm, I'm so careful. If I knew the plague was like down the street, I would like make sure I avoided the family that had the plague, right? That's in his time, this is even more sort of like viscerally terrifying. But in our time, it's not, it's not that different. Um, and he's like, and yet when it comes to my soul's health, when it comes to my sin, it's like I run around like running into houses where the plague is, running into places where my soul is going to get sick, just like blasting through doors where I know on the other side there's sin, temptation, despair, and death. Like, why, why am I so insanely reckless with my soul in a way that would be very hard to imagine you being with your body? And so this is just his first reflection. I've only given you sort of some moments of it. But he says, thou hast imprinted a pulse in our soul, but we do not examine it. A voice in our conscience, but we do not hear it. We talk it out, we jest it out, we drink it out, we sleep it out. And when we awake, we do not say with Jacob, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. 
But though, he says, but though we might know it, we do not, we will not. And so will God be able to help us. For we have been given the tools, the necessaries, he says, to know what makes the soul sick. And what a shocking thing it would be to not know your soul is sick until you first appear in hell. That's his first reflection, okay? <laughs> now I will say, it, he moves to a prayer from there, which is nice, which is positive. Um, but he's basically like, if our physical well-being can go away like that, and our spiritual life can go away like that, now why aren't we better at listening to and guarding against and protecting our souls from sin. In Psalm 32, David is talking about his soul. He's talking about a soul that is not perfect. He doesn't have any vision that anybody has some sort of uh, sinlessness about them. Um, he knows that human beings are full of sin, including himself. And yet what David is doing in Psalm 32 is he is rejoicing in a form of life where your sins have been forgiven and there is still time to live. A form of life where your sins have been forgiven and there is still time to live. Now, David in Psalm 32 is basically going to show us that there are ways that you can think about your own self, your own sin, your own issues before it's too late, before you're crushed by it, or indeed before you're cast out by it, or before you're consigned by it. You can think about your sin now. Uh, That's why we're going to be in this passage tonight. There may be things in your life right now that the Lord wants you to think about, and they are sin, and the Lord wants you to be able to face them. In our rush to go back to life as normal, we're resisting oftentimes in our hearts self-examination at a deep level. A lot of times we kind of realize in moments like this that there might not be that much depth and that part of what life offered us in in its busyness was a distraction from the lack of depth we actually had in our own souls. And so tonight, maybe for some of you, this will be a moment in which the Lord wants you to be honest and, 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 and face up to sin that's still in your heart, something that you're carrying around that is unconfessed, that is not, that is not bringing you into a place of health in your soul before the Lord uh, and giving you the fullness of life. Um, for others, it's just going to be a moment to remind us that the life that is truly joyful is the life of those who have been forgiven. And if we have lost our joy, it may be that we've lost sight of our forgiveness. It may be that we've lost sight of what the Lord has rescued us from, what he's forgiven us from. And so he's, he's going to give us ways to move forward where we're going to be able to say the forgiven life is the joyful life. The forgiven life is the joyful life. And I know everybody in the world wants a joyful life. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to have a full life. And I know to, right in this moment, it's really hard. There's anxiety and there's fears and there's all sorts of things. But there's also a lot of sin. And there's a lot of isolation. And there's a lot of bad habits. And there's a lot of hiding. And there's a lot of secrecy. And there's a lot of all sorts of things. And, and, and so the way for the Christian... The way to the life of happiness, the way to the joyful life, is through forgiveness. is through dealing seriously with your sin and being forgiven fully by Jesus. So, so that's, that's where we're headed. And, and David opens with the best news imaginable. He literally just says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. That last line's incredible to me um, because what it ultimately sort of captures is that the life that is forgiven is a life that is honest. It's a life that's open to the Lord. It's not a life that it needs to hide anymore. And so he's gonna have this contrast where sin is gonna force you to hide. Disobedience, uh, you know, the direct command, you know, the Lord has called you to do something or live in a certain way, um, to bear the fruit of the spirit, to trust him in certain moments, to, to treat your neighbor a certain way, to put certain things first and other things second and other things not in the list at all. And yet we disobey. 
that's one way you can sin, to just disobey the commandments of the teachings of the Lord, just to just disobey. I know the Lord said this, but I just don't, I'm just not doing that. That's not what I'm doing right now. So disobedience, when the Lord calls you to do something and you don't, right? That's sort of a direct form of just rebellion. That's, 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 a form, that's sin. That's a form of sin. Um, but also, there's a record of sin. There's a life of sin. There's little bits and, and accumulations of sin over the course of a life that, that will often sort of characterize you, carry with you. Sometimes it'll be like a dark cloud over you, kind of will add to anxiety or fear, stress. Um, you'll start catastrophizing. You'll think of past events and you'll say, that's definitely going to happen again. Um, you know, you'll, you'll view the world basically through the lens of, of an accumulation of, of sin. Uh, and so he also says, look, when you're forgiven, you're not just forgiven in moments where you disobey directly the Lord, but you're also cleared of all your guilt. Like anything that you have done that was, that was wrong, that was either against the Lord because you, you deliberately did that or against the Lord because you refused to obey, right? Commission or omission, they used to say. Either you sin because you did something you knew you should not have done or you sin because you didn't do something you should have done, right? Um, and so he's just talking about himself, right? Like we, we live in such a fragile little culture that <laughs> we don't want anyone talking about us having any sin. So, you know, just recognize, first of all, that David's talking from personal experience. He's not putting anybody else on glass. He's just like, unless you're not a human being and you're not paying attention and you're afraid to examine yourself, you would know, you know these things are true. But he says, man, what joy, like what joy is there for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight, Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. To live a life of complete honesty is the joyful life. And, and sometimes we think the joyful life is a certain amount of you know, money in the bank, or the joyful life is physical health, uh, or the joyful life is, I don't know, a certain number of friends, or the joyful life is a certain number of, um, or living in a certain neighborhood, or whatever it is. I mean, people define the joyful life any number of ways. You actually should take enough time to honestly say in your spirit, like, what you think the joyful life is. Like, what do you really think is, like, the good life? Not like the Sunday school answer that you're supposed to get, but, like, in your heart of hearts, like, what do you function out of? What do you feel is the good life, the joyful life, the, the full life? What do you really think that is? Because if you don't ever, like reckon with that, or if you don't ever put language to what you actually feel, you'll continually be confused as to why the scripture doesn't help you, <laughs> why it doesn't bring consolation, or why it doesn't bring you to a place of joy. And it may be that you haven't actually faced the fact that for, for you, you're operating with a joyful life definition that the scripture doesn't have. And, and that the Lord is saying the joyful life is the life that's lived completely honest. It's a life that's lived with integrity. It can be a humble life. It can be, it can be an unacknowledged life. Right? We talk about David struggling with, with being acknowledged or being, having his reputation dragged through the mud. Um, and the Lord would say to him, you can have a joyful life even if your reputation is dragged through the mud. Even if people just sort of you know, spit on the name of David. You can have a joyful life because the joyful life actually comes from a soul that is in an honest place with the Lord. Because if you're in an honest place with the Lord, that means your sin has been forgiven. It means that you're not in a way, you're not in a place where you need to hide. And all sin does is it makes you hide from God. It makes you hide from your neighbor or those closest to you. And it makes you hide from yourself. The sin literally is all about hiding. It's all about hiding. You know, God tells Adam and Eve to do something, and, and what do they do? They, they don't, they rebel, and then they hide. They hide in the trees, they hide behind leaves, they hide, and the Lord's like, why are you hiding? <laughs> and they might say, oh, because the effect of sin is psychological and spiritual and social alienation. <laughs> um, but they don't real, realize that, they just are reacting. But the effect of sin is that you hide. So you're not full of yourself, you're always having to try harder, posture, pretend, uh, any number of things. And David gets to a place where he's like, what an incredible thing to be able to just live in a life of complete honesty. <laughs> to just to be who you are, even with that record of failure, and to know the Lord has wiped that record away 
So you don't have to worry about what that means for you or the burden that that is on you. He said, man, what a joyful life to just be able to be who you are, who the Lord's called you to be, transparent, found in the light, right? Not hiding in any shadows, not pretending, not trying too hard, all these kinds of things. And, and, and what, he, what he does is he moves into remembering his life before he had confessed his sin. Not remembering his life before he sinned, because he doesn't have that memory. I, I don't think any of us uh, do. Um, but remembering what his life was like before he confessed his sin. So he's, you know, he's like, he's reflecting back. This is like what John Donne is doing ultimately in, in the devotions upon emergent occasions. He is taking enough time to really reflect on himself and who he's been and what that was actually like. And there's like a real lesson here for David, as there is for Dunn, as there hopefully is for us. Um, in reflecting back, he says, man, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Uh, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Now, scholars, like depending on who you read, will debate whether or not David is trying to make a comment, which may be totally valid, about the uh, psycho-spiritual connection or psychosomatic connection, right? When you are in a place of rebellion or sin uh, before the Lord, it can have actual and obvious consequences on your physical body. Uh, if you don't if you don't believe that, well, I don't, I don't know what to do if you don't believe that. Um, but I mean, just think of, uh, you know, your posture slumps. Um, you tend to fall into uh, bad habits of eating. You tend to fall into darker places where you're not as likely to sort of, I don't know, exercise or any number of things. There's all sorts of knock-on effects of a bad spiritual condition because you are an integrated self. You are not just a body, you're not just a soul, and those things are not easily disentangled. So this, the condition of your soul absolutely affects the condition of your body. So it may be that in part, when David says, I'm, when I can refuse to confess my sin, you know, when I was hiding spiritually, when I was holding back, and when I was disobedient, when I was refusing to tell the Lord I'm sorry, when I was refusing to acknowledge that I was even in rebellion, when I was refusing to even listen to the Lord, my body wasted away my body became so weak and frail like all the vitality or the energy for life got to get sort of sapped from me because i was just in this place of you know sort of like king theoden with worm tongue you know i just like curving into this darker place like literally start to age unusually right all these kinds of things that might happen to you the body the the soul these things are connected in ways that are not easy to disentangle. And so, so, so some would say that's, that's really what he's talking about. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But, but of course, he's, he's, he's also, and maybe even more so, talking about his whole self and his spiritual condition. Um, when I refused to confess my sin, I wasted away, right? Like, I, I withered. I think of C.S. Lewis's great sort of allegorical figures. I withered, I withered away. I groaned all day long. You think of the children of Israel groaning, grumbling, becoming a groan, becoming a grumble, right? I, I became this other self. Not just like, oh, I lost some, you know, some muscle mass or whatever. Um, but like my, my self deteriorated because I was refusing to deal with my sin. We have to be able to acknowledge that when you refuse to deal with your sin, the effects are actually dramatic. And the effects are actually meant to be dramatic because they're in part, as Dunn was trying to say, they're in part meant to be like a wake-up call where you get a fever, where your physical body gets a fever. There, there's supposed to be certain cues or reads when you're spiritually sick, when you're, when you're spiritually unwell, you know, I don't know, you start feeling more and more uncomfortable with church and don't judge me, and so you stop fellowshipping with other believers, or you stop opening up and asking for prayer for certain things, like you isolate more, you know, there, there should be certain cues where you're not just suddenly shocked by sin all the time, right? But where you're able to say, man, I've been like really like short-tempered lately, or man, I've been really like, I have like no patience, I've been really like, you know, in this place, that it, there should be reads for you in your life where you can say, wait a minute, I have like a fever. Wait, it's like a cough, right? Like I'm like, there's something unhealthy about me. Like you shouldn't have to wait 
uh, you know, to have to go to the hospital to realize there, you know, you might not be all right, you know. And so spiritually, when you refuse to deal with your sin, you, if you have any ability to pay attention and be honest about yourself, and I know this is part of what sin wants you not to do, so this is why it's complicated, you should see and people around you should be able to see that you are getting sick, that your soul is sick that something has gone out of you, that there's some vitality that's no longer there, that there's a strength that's no longer there. Uh, I remember being in a really down, dark place. I think, I'm sure I've shared it before because you poor people have heard me preach for 15 years and there's just only so many stories. Um, but I remember being in a down, dark place and I remember uh, Jess being like, dude, you know, the joy of the Lord is always your strength. And it was an encouragement, but it was also like, you got a fever, like you're sick. You haven't, you haven't been joyful, and that's who you are. Like you, You've always had the joy of the Lord. But this season, you've like the joy of the Lord has like left you. And it was just like a friend being able to say, this isn't okay. This isn't like, eh, you know, I just got to hang in there and move on to the next season. He was like trying to bring my attention to a spiritual reality that was affecting who I actually was as a person before God, as a person connected to God. David's not talking about people who are not connected to God. David's talking about people who know the Lord, people who are connected to the Lord in some way. And so you should be able to tell if you take your pulse and, and, and your spiritual pulse is racing, like it's just like, it's completely unsteady, it's all over the map, um, it's fraught with anxiety, you're having trouble finding the peace of God. It, it's not to be like, oh, how dare you, what's wrong with you? It's to be like, oh, something's wrong, something's wrong. Um, maybe I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like going before the Lord. Maybe I'm not, I'm not noticing something. Maybe I'm not slowing down to take time in the word. You know, you should be able to check. And just like you would say, I need to drink more water. I need to get more sleep. Just like you would say, I need to wear a stinking mask on my face so that I don't spew these particles into other people's faces. Um, just like you would say any normal thing. I need to eat this. I need to eat better. I need to do this. I need to exercise. I need to, just like you would say that for any normal thing when you got sick. You should be able to see that, man, when you are holding on to sin, it will show, it will manifest. There will be symptoms of that sin. David says, when I refused to confess my sin, I wasted away. I groaned. My strength evaporated like, like water in the summer heat. When he's talking about this sin, he, he's not just saying, like, I can't believe I sinned. It's almost like the moment after sin. It's like I denied, it's like I denied that I was sinning. It's like I denied that it was a big deal. I refused, he says, to confess my sin. That's where things got really escalated. It's not that I lost my temper. It's not, it's not that I, I stepped out of line here or I, I, I did something I shouldn't have done and, and, you know, I can't believe that happened. It's after that. I refuse to admit it. It's like I started this argument and I refused to back down even though I knew I was being a jerk or I knew I was wrong. It's, 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 it's deeper. It's not, it's not just like uh, impulsively, ah, man, I was just, I was out of, you know, I was just out of it that day and I just, I reacted really poorly. It's like, no, you reacted really poorly and then you refused to admit it. You denied it. You, 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 you added to it, you added to your sin denial. You added to your sin stubbornness. You added to your sin pride. <laughs> you know, I mean, you compounded this thing, which, you know, the human life, even the life that's connected to God is one that struggles with sin. And David's saying, when I stopped struggling, when I refused to confess it, when I refused to deal with it, oh man, it started to take all the life out of me. It started to all my spiritual health, all my strength, Maybe physical strength as well. I wouldn't be surprised. But the energy that you have to spend to deny your sin before God and in your heart, the energy you have to spend to posture, the energy you have to spend to disconnect and not take ownership of your own sin, the energy you have to expend exhausts you. It actually takes energy to resist confessing your sin. It takes energy to continue to pretend or to continue to hide. It's not easy to hide. You have to put in some work to continue to hide from yourself, you know, refuse to admit something from others, refuse to admit something that you were wrong, refuse to apologize, refuse to make amends, refuse to treat people the way you should because you're just convinced 
your ideas are right and their ideas are wrong and so they don't deserve your kindness or whatever it is. Like it, it's exhausting. It takes a lot of energy to continue to hide from the call of God, to continue to sew fig leaves together, as it were, to continue running further and further into the forest. That takes energy and it will show. It will be symptomatic. It will, it will be apparent if you actually slow down. And so maybe I could ask that right now. And, you know, don't type it in <laughs> or whatever in the comments thread. Um, but, like, do you notice any symptoms of spiritual sickness? Do you notice any symptoms of spiritual sickness? Do you notice any symptoms of sin that may not have been dealt with or may, may be not dealt with, right? For David, this was like an incredibly important thing. He's reflecting on it in an honest and open way so that other people will have the opportunity to hear and apply it to themselves. This is not just some pointless kind of confessional post, you know, in our world where it just makes him feel better about himself. He, he's genuinely like, man, this, this was terrible. Like, I, wa I was wasting away. Like, I lost the joy of the Lord. I lost the strength of the Lord. I lost, I lost my connection to the Lord. And yet, all the while, everyone thought, oh, he, he's David. He knows the Lord. And so, so, you know, can we be contemplative enough about our own souls can you take the pulse of your soul right now and say, man, is it, is it racing? Is it steady? Is it, is it like barely there? Is it, uh, does it need like some life support? Like, can you take the pulse? Can you check, um, as Dunn would say, can you apply the kinds of things we would check to see if the body was well? Can you apply that now with the power of the Spirit, with the honesty of you before the Lord, no one being put on blast here, no one being pointed at, everyone safe literally where you are, wherever you're hearing this, to just you, your heart before God, are there symptoms of any spiritual uh, loss of health? Are there symptoms of any sin that may be there that maybe you didn't even think to you like it was sin because it's not like you went out of your way to hurt someone, but maybe the Lord has been calling you to a place and you've been refusing to go. Maybe it is just disobedience. Uh, that's the first thing he mentions when he's talking about this is that disobedience, like if the Lord calls you to trust him in a certain area and you're, you're just not going to that place. Um, or he called you to step into something or take responsibility or you know find life in a certain area and you're like, I don't want to, I'm not in, I don't, that's not the place I wanna go. Um, it may be just a sort of like, I just ignored him. Uh, well, that's sin, you know, it, it, it's like, that's what it means to disobey is the Lord speaks to you and you don't follow through, right? So. Can you find anything in yourself that says, man, I, this, this has been, quarantine's hard, this pandemic's hard, everything's weird already. But maybe during this time, because life has slowed down or because, I mean, it hasn't, like for Lisa and I, it's gotten just more exhausting than ever before, I think. Um, maybe she's like, this is normal and I'm just getting, I think I'm just getting introduced to how exhausting life actually was. And she's like, yeah, I get a little help now. Um, I've never been so exhausted in all my life, um, you know, because I lost a commute, I lost the, you know, ability to listen to a podcast or, or anything, you know, I have like no, I have no, so I had to like realize that I didn't have uh, certain resources, I had to make sure I was able to even keep track, there, I felt like there would be days where I like had no track of where I was at. Um, I remember going to a men's study a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, and John was basically just asked that question. I think he, you know, probably asked it most weeks or something. You know, how are you doing? What's something that you're dealing with, struggling with, dealing with challenge? What's a challenge or something like that? Where are you at? You know, just a base, just a super basic question. And I remember just feeling like, I don't know. <laughs> like, like it felt like I had not even been able to keep track of my own soul. Like I hadn't even, like I wasn't even, I didn't even know how to find myself. You know, I was like, where, where are you? Where are you? You know? Um, because of just the change, the pace, you know, just all the things that we got to do and do well. It's, it's one of those things that I, I felt genuinely in my heart, like, I'm not sure uh, where I'm at. And it took me like a minute and other people shared and it was all articulate and I was like really inspired by it. And it was encouraging, helped me to find kind of find my way when I heard other people talk. Um, but, you know, maybe it's just that. Maybe during this time you sort of lost track of where you're at with the Lord. And it's not that you're like in a, some horrible place. It's just that you're not really sure where you are. Um, maybe it's just that you've lost touch with 
where the Lord is in your heart and what he wants you to be talking about him with, uh, dealing with, kind of attacking, approaching, trusting him. You know, maybe it's just that you're just like not really connected to that. That's I felt that in my own heart. Not that I was trying to disobey or avoid something or run away from something, but that I just really wasn't that connected to where I was at uh, and where I was at before the Lord as a soul, as a spirit. And so when, when in this moment, he goes, he says in this moment, he goes, when I turned the corner, when I stopped hiding, I finally confessed all my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. There's this incredible, this is an incredible turn. And, and, you know, I just can't emphasize this enough. Like David's talking to people of God. To, he's talking to people who know the Lord. He's talking to people who the Lord, like when you go astray with the Lord, like the Lord doesn't like just let you run off into the wilderness. Like he says in verse four, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. Like, you know, when you get on this other side of the Lord where you're like forcing him to always correct you, like the hand of the Lord's discipline gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And, and David like started to feel that more and more. He started to feel like, you know, it's one thing to just be like, oh, I was rebelling, I was disobeying, but not, you know, whatever, uh, I'll figure it out or I'll, I'll get back on track when, <laughs> when I get a little more time. Um, if you're connected to the Lord, the Spirit's going to be convicting you. He's going to be calling to you. He's going to be struggling with you. He's going to be fighting for you. And the Lord's hand of discipline is going to be trying to correct you, trying to steer you back. You know, the people are going to show up and say things that you needed to hear and you don't want to hear. You know, like the Lord's not going to like, like let you just go. He loves you, right? Uh, he, he disciplines those he loves. And so David, being connected to the Lord, goes through this time in which he's not dealing with his sin. He's not confessing his sin. He gets spiritually more and more sick. And the Lord's discipline gets heavier and heavier and heavier, and it's harder and harder and harder. You know, one of the prayers we pray at our church is like, Lord, don't put us too hard to the test. <laughs> like, help us to learn the lesson we need to learn from whatever we're going through and not have to learn it 5, 10, 15, 20 times. I mean, how many of us, our lives are like basically a record of not having learned certain lessons except on the 35th time? Uh, and maybe even still to this day, uh, haven't learned certain lessons. The hand of discipline from the Lord is going to weigh on you, right? You're you're putting the Lord in a position where He's always having to correct you. Like what a what? A, like any parent knows, like that's the worst place to be. Like you don't want to be in that place where you're always having to correct. But you also can't just be like, ah, <laughs> let them let them be what they are, right? Like if 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 your kid is not learning something, they're not you know they're not following through. They're not learning how to be obedient. They're not you know in 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 a place that's healthy, safe, good, maturing. You know whatever. Um, then you have to constantly be in a place where you figure out how best to correct them and help them find a better path. How amazing is it if you are a parent when you don't have to do that? When it's like a good day or a good moment of a day and you're just like looking at this child and you're just like, this is like the best thing in the universe. It's like I was reading um, with John yesterday, Pilgrim's Progress. We got a little, literally a little Pilgrim's Progress. And we were reading this one. It's literally called, I'm doing like book hour. It's called Little, Little Pilgrim's Progress. And I was reading this to John the other day, and we read chapter after chapter. It's an amazing time for my son to come out of his room and <laughs> announce. Uh, okay, sorry, that's too funny. Um, but anyway, I was, uh, John and I were curled up on the couch, and we were reading Pilgrim's Progress. And we're reading about a little Christian, like this pilgrim. This is a hardcore book, by the way. <laughs> my son's four. He's pretty tough, but uh, he's like, geez, you know. Um, so we're reading this stuff about, about Pilgrim's Progress. And like, there's just this incredible moment. I'm like, how do I even have a son? <laughs> how do I have a child? And how am I able to read this book with my son, who's like leaning against me, like in the sweetest moment imaginable. Like, it was just this moment where I was just like, I just love being, you know, this kid's dad, you know. Um, and, and it's so sad or frustrating when I can't just, you know, like be in that place when I'm like, John, you can't hit your sister or whatever it is, you know, you can't take that away or that. 
come on, buddy. You know, like, it's just like, ah, I don't want to be in that position. But I mean, you have to be. You can't give up on, on, on actually raising your kid. Um, but it's just like, you know, when the Lord, when your relationship with the Lord is one of constant rebellion and then him constantly having to correct and like, you know, call you back, like, what a sad, can I just say that? What a sad relationship. Like, what a, what a sad connection with God if that's the place that you regularly um, are, are meeting him in is rebellion, correction, rebellion, correction. Like, there are seasons of life, I get it, where we're like, you know, babies or we're like teenagers spiritually. But what a, what a sad thing if, the, if, if many moments of your life with the Lord is just the Lord having to like constantly try to steer you back, you know? Like there's so much life that you're missing in the Lord when he's constantly having to correct you, um, when he's constantly having to discipline you. Uh, and so David's like, man, when his hand of discipline was heavier and heavier on me, oh man, I, my strength was zapped. And, and like my relationship with the Lord was not like this fun, good thing because I was like asking the Lord to approach me in this other way, like a father who was having to constantly correct me. And, and David's like, but the moment, the turn in verse 5, when I confessed my sins to you, when I just gave up. Like right now, people are dying on all sorts of the wrong hill. This is the right hill of die on. Right? Confess all your sins. Stop trying to hide your guilt. When I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion. It's like, man up. Like, woman up. I don't know what that phrase means. But woman up and <laughs> confess your rebellion to the Lord. We're so fragile. We're so soft. Our little culture is like, just get, get, don't, don't, don't waste a second with that. Just be able to be a place where you have the freedom to actually confess your sins to the Lord. And stop trying to hide. Stop trying to hide. And and David feels this incredible turn. He says, you forgave me, right? Expostulation. You forgave me. All my guilt is gone. I mean, it is very much. It is very much and can it be, right? It is very much sort of my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Like, it, it, it really is. It really is very much like when Christian finally gets to the cross and this burden that's been on his back. I mean, He's like curved in. He's like, you know, people, it's such an interesting story. Some people see his burden and other people, he tells them he has a burden. They're like, you don't have a burden. Why do you keep pretending you have a burden? Because <laughs> they have no spiritual vision. So they can't see that he actually has sin. They're like, you don't have sin. Like, <laughs> these are like his friends from the old city. He's like, you don't have any sin. Why do you keep saying you have sin? You don't have any sin. You don't have any burden. There's no burden on your back. And then when he gets into places like the Slav Dispon, when he gets into places of despair, he finds that he actually sinks faster because he has sin on his back. Like we're all going through hard things. You can't avoid that. We're going through a loneliness. We're going through anxiety. We're going through some fear. We're going through all sorts of uncertainty. But when you have that sin and it's not released, it's not confessed, it's like you have this extra weight on you. So when you go into a place that is hard for everybody, like the slough of this bond, or you have to walk through a dead marshes or something like this, when you have a burden of sin that's not been dealt with, you sink faster. Right? That's literally the, the point of that, that, that uh, moment in the story. Is Christian has this burden. Pliable doesn't even really have the same kind of burden. He's not even aware of it. He doesn't even sink as fast. Christian is like aware of this and it's like, oh my God. And he starts sinking faster into like the quicksand, slough of the spawn, like mud pit. And, and it's not until Christian gets to the cross. Uh, John Dunn says, man, we'll do anything to deal with our symptoms some other way. We'll try to drink it away. We'll try to sleep it away. We'll try to play it away. We'll try to pretend it away, right? But there's only one way to actually free yourself of this burden, to actually let those things go. And it's at the foot of the cross. It's, it's confessing your sin to the Lord Jesus, receiving the forgiveness for your sin and the chains falling off, your heart being set free, rising up and following the Lord, right? That's it. There's only one way to do this. You have, to, you have to face up to it, man up, woman up, whatever. You have to confess where you've been and say, I don't want to be in that place anymore. I want to be free of this. I want to drop this burden at the foot of the cross. I want to move forward. There may be another slough of despond around the corner, but this time you won't sink as fast. This time you'll know immediately to look for help to reach out to. This time you'll be like ready to actually navigate the very difficult things of real life. David's life does not become just magic and rainbows. It becomes like a life that is livable, a life where he can recover joy. He says, therefore, right? Because trust me, this is my experience. This is true. My guilt is gone. He has forgiven me from this. This, this chains have fallen off. This burden has been released. It's like a physical weight being taken off of him. 
And he says, therefore, please, please, therefore, let all the godly pray, pray to you, Lord, while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment, that they may not, as Dunn says, first recognize their sin when they're in hell. Right? Like that would be the most insane thing if you, you only finally reckoned with your sin when it was way too late. And that's what David says in verse 6. He says, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment, that they may not recognize it when it's too late and, and sin is wrapped around their ankles like stones just pulling them under the water. Like, let, like this time is of the essence. Now more than ever before, this is cast in sharp relief for us. A moment of uncertainty, an age of anxiety, all the things that people are dealing with. You don't need to hide from that. You do need to face up to that. And you do need to say, man, what an incredibly urgent and important moment for me to deal with the sin, any rebellion, any disobedience, any, any, anything that I have just stubbornly refused to seek the Lord and receive the word from the Lord and listen to the Lord and obey the Lord and, be, and been a good witness to the Lord and, and, and followed through with what the Lord showed me. Like, this is the time. It's not tomorrow. Just as if you were running a fever of like 104 right now, you know, we would, everybody, everything would be rushing you to urgent care, okay? You know, if you're like, I have underlying, you know, anything you recognize physically right now, man, we would be so hyper like aware of the need for care and attention. And we would just be on it so quickly. I am just pleading with you in your spirit where there is sickness, where there has been loss of joy, where there has been loss of peace, where there has been some kind of, you know, arrhythmic heartbeat, where there has been some relationships that are too tense and not, there isn't life, there isn't health, there isn't kindness, there isn't patience and peace and the so sober mindedness of the Holy Spirit in those channels, something is blocking those arteries. Something is clogging up your, your arteries. Needs to be dealt with. This is the time. It's not, it's literally not tomorrow. It's tonight, it's today. When you're on your, your, your sick bed, and it might be your deathbed, that's, you're, you're like, okay, going down the list, like what matters? What do I do? What can I do? Can I take that supplement? Can I drink more water? Like what can I do? David says it right now. Let all the godly pray right now while there is still time. Let, just tonight, uh, maybe while I pray, when I close this, pray right now and just ask the Lord, please take this, this rebellion out of my heart. Please forgive me of this guilt. I know I shouldn't have done that. I know I shouldn't have walked in this way. I know I shouldn't have walked away from you. Please just forgive me of these sins. Please take these burdens off of me for trying to seek you or seek joy in places you hadn't called me. For you, he says in verse 7, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. And this is an incredible poetic and spiritual term. The life of sin is a life of hiding. Hiding from yourself. Hiding from the Lord. Hiding from others. Pretending. Pretending. Posturing. You know, puffing up your, yourself with pride. That's hiding not re really dealing with who you are, not being able to live in that honest life that he talks about, those who have dealt with their sin or confessing their sin. The life of sin is a life of hiding. And what David does in verse seven, he says, when you deal with your sin, when you confess your sin, you don't hide from the Lord anymore. You hide in the Lord. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Everything I used to do to hide from reality, to hide from difficult relationships, to hide from garbage things in my own heart, in my own habits, everything I used to do to hide or to pretend I was doing fine when I was actually spiritually sick, everything I used to do to hide from the Lord ultimately, to hide from myself, to hide from other people, when you are the person set free to confessing your sin, having the Lord forgive you of those sins, you are the person who hides in the Lord. Um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, uh, Lisa and I watched uh, the Terrence Malick film, 
a hidden life. And it, it's based on a true story, and I, I don't even want to tell you much of it because I really do hope everyone has a chance to see it. it it's a long movie. It's not maybe what you're expecting if you're not used to a Terrence Malick movie. It maybe is what you're expecting if you are. Um, but one of the things in the movie, it, in the movie's title, A Hidden Life, it draws on this idea and it draws on this incredible quote from George Eliot, um, who was one of the greatest authors um, in the English language. If you ever have a chance, um, some of you are tackling big, big novels. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm really impressed. Um, one of the big, big novels you uh, ought to, to tackle is, uh, is a novel called Middlemarch. And in, in, in Middlemarch, George Eliot basically looks at the smallest uh, scope imaginable, sort of a, an, Engli an English sort of country town, it's very sort of Jane Austen kind of, look at like ordinary life, small life, life even sort of outside the city as it were, um, life that, that goes sort of unregarded, life that is sort of maybe humble, life that is maybe, um, I don't know, doesn't get the accolades, is it sort of like this great human person theory of history or whatever. You know, we think of history as moved forward by these strong figures, these incredible personalities or these, these incredible ideas or whatever. But at a certain point in Middlemarch, George Eliot says, the growing good of the world, to the extent that there is this growing good in the world, is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. She's saying that the little good that is in the world that makes life a little more livable for all of us where the world is not as bad as it could be. And my friends, the world is pretty bad. Um, I've been so grieved by, by so many things, um, and, it, and it is so dark, and our country is so sick. Our country is so sick, sick with racism, sick with anger, sick with violence, sick with hostility, sick with a form of godliness that has no power in it because it seeks power for itself. Sick of fake Christianity. Our, our, our country is sick from so many things. And one of the things it's most sick from is godly people who have not dealt with their own sin and keep running out trying to lead and direct and steer and win and etc 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 and George Eliot says man that there is any goodness that is there is that there are some people there are some people but we don't know who they are because they don't matter in the way that that the headlines you know get attention from certain people but the growing good of the world she says the good in this little world she's talking about is half owing to the number who lived faithfully, a hidden life. And I would say with David, the salt and light that remains in this country, the salt and light that remains in our communities is going to be down to those who live a life that is hidden in Christ. Who live a life that is hidden in Christ. For you are my hiding place. For when I am afraid, I turn to you. I don't turn to a bad habit. I don't turn to trying to dominate some situation or, or person. Um, when, when, I am, when I am sick, I turn to you. When I am afraid, I turn to you. When I am confused, I turn to you. When, when I am in this world and I am not enough for this world and I don't know how to be in this world, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. You will surround me with songs of victory. The people who are going to have a witness right now in this sick and perhaps dying country are going to be those who are not hiding from God. 
and sometimes hiding from God in plain sight, from what I can tell. But are those who are not hiding from God, who are not hiding from their neighbor, who are not hiding from themselves, but are those who are hiding in God, those who are living a hidden life in the bosom of their Creator, those who are living a life that is hidden in Christ, whose identity is being given to them by Jesus at His good pleasure and His good timing. David says, Many sorrows come to the wicked, but man, the Lord, for those who turn to Him, He says, I'll guide you along the best pathway. I'll advise you. I'll watch over you. You don't need to be like a senseless horse or mule. You're not an animal. You're a human being. You're, you're meant to be able to walk in this way, to be able to live a full life, not, not to be constantly corrected like an animal with a bit between its teeth and, and reins, you know, pulling back, constantly turning its head. Like, you're not meant to live a life that is just constantly the Lord having to sort of correct you or having to, you know, you're meant to live a life that goes from, from, from hiding in the Lord, being safe in the Lord, to growing in the Lord, to resting in the Lord, to developing maturity in the Lord, to being able to, to tap into resources in the Holy Spirit of the Lord, where you can actually freely and joyfully begin to live an honest life in the Lord, for the Lord, for your neighbor, for yourself, for everything, because that's what Christ has called you to. And that's the life of joy that he, he began with. That's the life that obedience yields to. He says the life of those who obey. Those who obey are the ones who rejoice in the Lord. He says in verse 11, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. And this is Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 31. If I have a life verse, which I never thought of myself as having a life verse, uh, but if I have a life verse, it's John 8, 31. Jesus said to the people who believe in him, You are truly my disciples. If you remain faithful to my teachings, if you obey my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom is on the other side of obedience. Joy is found through obedience. It's not found in rebellion. It's not found through power. It's not found through exalting yourself. It's not found in trying to pretend, you know, and fake it till you make it. It's not like trying to act like you're something you're not, for hiding from this, hiding from that, hiding from yourself. Obedience is freedom. Obedience is joy. The pure heart is the heart that is free because it obeys Jesus. It is living honestly and openly in his light. It is hiding in him when it is afraid or when it needs protection or when it needs to find out who it really is. It doesn't go anywhere but rushing back to him. It is a life that is hidden in Christ and it is a life that is completely honest. It's a life that's free. It's a life that has joy in it and goodness. And for those who live that kind of life hidden in Christ, you will be a witness. You will bring salt and light to others. You will be able to encourage a brother or sister if you see that they are spiritually sick. You will be able to pray for them that they may be well. You will be able to see your own heart and be even more sensitive to when your pulse kind of shifts or when your temperature rises a little bit, or when you feel like you've lost a little strength in the Lord, you'll be able to be like, wait a minute. And you'll be able to turn to the Lord. You'll be able to say, I've been afraid. I haven't been trusting in you. I need to hide in you. I need to trust you. You're going to protect me. No matter what happens, you're going to protect me. You're going to show me the way to live. You're going to lead me on this path. I can trust you. I don't need to have anxiety about next week, next month, next year tomorrow um, because you're going to show me the best path for my life you're going to advise me you're going to watch over me if you say something i'm going to be able to hear it because i'm going to recognize your voice you're not trying to trick me you're not trying to you're not trying to say well i only said it once but you didn't catch it so you missed it if the lord's speaking and you're listening you're going to hear him you're going to hear him obedience is freedom obedience is joy the joyful life my friends is the life of the person who has confess their sin before the living God. The chains have fallen off that heart. The burden has fallen at the foot of the cross. You feel lighter. You feel more able to love your neighbor. You feel more able to be selfless. You feel more able to have the mind that is in Christ. You feel more able to be kind. You feel more able to not react out of frustration or hostility or confusion or fear or uncertainty in the way that our very sick country and our very sick culture and our very sick Christianity is currently doing. But instead, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to give you His righteousness in the place of your sin, 
to free your heart to find again the strength that is the joy of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I pray right now for anyone here who has sensed that they have sin that has been hiding, a sin that has been unconfessed. Um, we can be so focused right now on uh, the economy and on work and on physical health and all sorts of important things. But I pray that maybe this last hour you've given us a moment to actually contemplate our own soul, to actually find where we are with you and find if there's anything in us that has been hiding. And I pray that for that woman or that man, in recognizing that, they would hear the exhortation of the psalmist. Today is the day. Confess this while you still have time. Receive complete forgiveness. Hide in the Lord. Don't hide from the Lord. And so for anyone right now, Lord, who hears this and has sin that they want to confess, I pray now, at this moment, you would hear that confession. pray that we would believe you more than we believe our sin that when you say we are forgiven it is so profoundly true it is as though a real burden was falling from our backs it is as though true chains were being broken and loosed from our hearts it is though a fever that has spiked and threatened our life has suddenly abated and our forehead is cool again and we feel energy and strength coming back into our limbs into our face into our breath and our vision is getting clearer and our muscles are feeling more and more taut and alive and our back and our, our, our bones are feeling less achy, less sore, less infirm, less, less uncertain. And they're, they're feeling the vitality of true, stable, strong life flow back in them. Lord, any of us remembers what, it like, what it's like to be sick and what an incredible relief it is to be well again. I pray for my brothers and sisters now that they would realize in the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus, through the power of his word and the greatness of his sacrifice, they are well again. And help us, Lord, to sit up from that sick bed where our souls have languished too long and help us to stand out of that bed to meet the day, to enter into the life you have given us, the life of relationships and love, a life of hope, a life of good things, a life of good responsibilities, a life of deep meaning and deep purpose and a very good and very kind God. And I pray, Lord, that you would quicken our spirits, bring back, revive, this life in us again, the power of the Holy Spirit to live a hidden life in Christ, to live a humble life in the world, a life in which alone is the true strength of God. I pray this for everyone listening. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. My friends, I thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be in the Word together. Um, I, I just think this is such an incredible moment to, to be contemplating our souls before the Lord. And I hope, I hope that I've encouraged you a little bit to, to, to continue to do that and, uh, and to find the Lord in, in those places that you need him most.
Um, and my ongoing prayer for all of us is that we stay steady during this time, is that we do not lose our witness during this time, is that we remain responsible to love our neighbors uh, and to consider others as more important than ourselves uh, during this time. Um, for how else will they see Christ except as those who lay down their life for their friend and for those around them that Christ has called us to love. So it is a moment of opportunity, but the only way we can be Jesus' witnesses is if we're dealing with those deep issues and we're letting him bring health back to our living souls. I love you well. Um, we have uh, just a reminder, Sunday service is at, starts at 10 with worship uh, with good lady Michaela uh, leading us in worship and then 10.30. Uh, Pastor John continuing in our time in John's Gospel. Um, I just hope you're able to, to join us to get some, some connection with the Word um, and to get that steady diet of the Word in your life. And then if you can make it Tuesday, send an email to John or Kathy to, uh, to attend the men's and women's study where we're able to actually check in and where we're at, <laughs> which can be really important right now, especially, but it's you know, hard to do unless you have a moment to do it. Um, we can check in, you can get prayer, you can just confess, you can do whatever you need to do, um, but you can just share and just touch base and, and check your pulse as it were. So um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to stay connected. Uh, in those ways, uh, I would also just encourage you to continue to pray for our church. Continue to pray for what the Lord's calling us to do. Pray for wisdom, pray for health, pray for sanity, pray for safety. Uh, John and I are trying to make the best decisions we know how to make through prayer. Um, we feel like we're in a privileged position where we do not feel desperate to have to meet as soon as possible because we feel, we feel confident that the Lord is with each and every one of you and that you're able to grow where you are right now. And, uh, and that you're not on life support because you don't see my ugly face even closer. <laughs> um, so we are, we are aching to see you again. We want to be able to share that moment again, but we will of course uh, not do that until the Lord uh, tells us that it is wise and that it is fair and that it is the best thing for our neighbors, um, especially our neighbors who are more, more vulnerable. Um, so that's where we're at and to continue to pray for us in that way, but continue to pray for each other, continue to show up for each other, to continue to reach out to each other, continue to just love each other. Um, we're Christians. Nothing's going to keep us from being the people of God. Nothing's going to keep us from this. Uh, you're about to get a third sermon out of me, so I, I better let you go. Um, Godspeed to everybody. So much love, all the good things. Uh, and if you have to go, go in peace and may God go with you.